Cami, you ready? Gemma, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a, a little introduction. Uh, so we're starting to record. This is the first talk of the New York City Category Theory Seminar. We meet uh, every Wednesday or every other Wednesday or something like that. Um, so uh, we have lots of different and interesting and not uh, typical talks. And this is going to be um, one of them. Um, it's going to be better than typical and, and whatever. Um, so I just want to welcome all of you. And, and um, if you want, you can, uh, come, you're welcome to come to all the seminars. It's quite, it's a lot of fun and people laughing and joking and, and, and uh, low pressure. Um, tonight we're having Gemma de la, de la, de la Couve. Well, she's going to pronounce her name properly. And she's talking about from simplicity to universal universality and undecidable undecidability. I want to say this is um, not yet a category theory talk, but um, from what I've read about it, it should be and it will be. So um, I'm going to let her um, uh, do do the talking. Uh, Gemma, take it away. Oh, uh, Gemma, one second. We have a little. Um, we have a little um, tradition in the seminar that before you start, you tell us something about you. Uh, like we have uh, four questions. Where were you born? Where did you get your bachelor's degree? Where did you get your PhD? And where you're now? Where are you now? So if you can start off the talk saying something like that, that would be um, very nice. Okay, sure. Thanks a lot, Nozon. Thanks for having me. And hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Gemma de las Cuevas. Um, I was born in Barcelona 36 years ago, and I studied physics in Barcelona, and then did my, my PhD in Innsbruck, Austria, in quantum information, and then moved to Munich for a postdoc on some more mathematical aspects of some quantum many body systems, and, and I'm back to Innsbruck since 2016, where I now have a, a group um, we have a website it's called thelascuevasgroup.com and we, um, I'm very happy to work with um, what I think is a, a really fun team, a really good team. And um, we've been thinking a lot about universality and undecidability. And particularly we've been trying to come up with an overarching framework to um, include, to encompass the various types of universality and undecidability. And I feel, or I have some um, symptoms, I see symptoms that uh, category theory may be the right framework to do so. So that's one of the main reasons why I'm interested in learning about category theory. And in fact, we are in, with our group, we are all attending a category theory course by Tobias Fritz, who is also at the University of Innsbruck now. So, and I've had some exposure before, so I know some very basic things, but I'm definitely a beginner um, and I'm willing to learn. So um, that's where I come from, that's where I'm at. And, Thank you, uh, that's perfect, that's perfect. Thank you. And um, I should also say that I'm, most of what I will say about undecidability or some part is very inspired by um, an article that Nozon wrote in 2003 uh, on making Lovier's theorem accessible to to lay people, uh, which I enjoyed greatly and which inspired me a lot to, to think about the scope of undecidability. And I hope I'll, I'll explain at least um, how I see things um, during this talk. All right, so um, you're welcome to ask any questions uh, during the talk or after the talk as you wish. Um, so yeah, so I'll tell you the story of how simplicity becomes very easily very complicated. Uh, more precisely, it becomes universal. S simple systems easily become universal. And how I see universality as the other side of the coin of undecidability. Um, but how we cannot make this intuition precise yet. So to this end, um, I'd like to start by with an observation, namely that simple rules can generate lots of complexity. I'm sure you have examples from your everyday life, but I'd like to give you uh, a few formal examples. The first one are cellular automata. I'm sure you're familiar with them, but 
you can see them as a little game where we have um, two cells of two possible colors, black and white. And we have um, update rules where specifying that if the three upper cells are black then the cell underneath becomes white. If they are black, black, white, then it becomes white. If they are black, white, black, it becomes white. Black, white, white gets black and so on for the other four possibilities. That's one example of a cellular automaton. And we additionally start with a very simple configuration where um, particularly the top row, that's what I'm looking at right now, where all cells are white except for the middle one, which is black. And we now apply these rules in order to obtain the black white configuration of the second row. And then we apply them again to obtain the black white configuration of the third row and so on. And we see the black spreading into this triangle shape, but it seems to be unclear what's happening inside the triangle. So we can run the simulation for a few more steps. Yeah. And well, we see that on the one hand, some periodic patterns emerge, but on the other hand, something that seems to be very complicated emerges. Well, to the best of my knowledge, this is really as complex as it gets in classical physics um, because a row of this um, cellular automaton is used as a pseudo random number generator in Mathematica. Um, and the, the bottom line here is that these simple looking rules together with that simple initial configuration is incredibly expressive or can explore a very complicated landscape. In particular, it can generate super complicated and like irreducible patterns in some sense. And um, there are many more examples uh, in this book by Steph Stephen Wolfram. Okay, um, I come from the world of spin models and this was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple of years, a couple of days ago. Um, in its very simplistic form, they are again um, models with a variable in the simplest case. That it's called a spin, but don't be impressed by the word spin. It's just a classical degree of freedom, which in this case can take two values up and down, up or down, or zero or one, or black or white. It can stand really for anything, uh, these two values. They can stand for the magnetic spin really of the particles, which is where the, the name comes from, or for models of matter, or for viruses, or for language, or for rainforests, or for um, opinion segregation, or for, I mean, virtually this, the, the model I will, or for, or for protein folding, like for the amino acids in a position in the protein. So you can just think of this as, an, as a classical degree of freedom, as a variable. Classical because there are all, there's also the quantum version of these spin models, which I won't mention here. All right. And then there's some local um, energy rules. That's in physics, it's, that's the local Hamiltonian, which specifies which which were the interactions in the systems, more particularly, which configurations lead to less energy. So in this case, um, well, these are the rules of the famous easing model, specifying that if two neighboring spins are pointing in the same direction, then this gets less energy than if they point in opposite directions. And on the other hand, there's a competition with so you may know that physical systems tend to minimize the energy so they will tend to align the spins but on the other hand um, there's a competition with maximizing the disorder or the entropy which will tend to misalign the spins and moreover one considers or that that's one example that i'm showing showing you here you can place these uh, variables in a grid and you can study whether the minimization of the energy or the maximization of the disorder wins. And well, this is the, so which, which of the two wins will depend on the temperature. So 
there will be a so-called phase transition. This is the very famous phase transition of the, to the Ising model. Um, but in fact, all of these details do not matter for the message I'm trying to get across. My message so far is that this is a simple spin model um, in the sense that the variables only have um, are binary, right? The uh, energy function only depends on neighboring spins and the variables are placed on a two-dimensional square grid. Uh, and the main message again is that these simple spin models are in fact very expressive. In some sense, as expressive as they can be. Namely, they can simulate for a precise notion of simulation, all other spin models that includes like models on um, where the spin is higher dimensional or where the interactions are um, depend on like multiple particles at a time. For, for example, people in physics, people call this four body interactions or K body interactions for any K or where the spins are placed on a higher dimensional grid or really anything. Um, so the message again is that these look deceivingly simple. It is in fact as expressive as it can be. Okay. The best example, of course, is that of Turing machines. I mean, we're so used to the existence of universal Turing machines and the existence of software that perhaps we have forgotten, or at least what still amazes me is uh, the fact that naively, if you imagine a more complicated computation, you may have kind of inferred that that more complicated computation needs to run on a more complicated machine. That would have been the naive expectation. This is of course not the case, like simple architectures of machines, or I would call them simple machines directly, namely Turing machines are as expressive as, as they get as any machine, as any computational machine gets, forgetting about the hybrid computation and so on, of course. Um, namely, they can run any algorithm. Well, that, of course, relies on the church Turing thesis, but this is the, the situation for computation as well. And um, we find a similar kind of situation and similar statements for neural networks. Uh, for example, for feedforward neural networks, there is a so-called universal approximation theorem that guarantees that a simple architecture, again, like with a single, a single hidden layer, um, suffices for the network to learn any function which is well-behaved. So they, they need to be in some sort of a class. But, but again, we find that um, simple looking networks with um, simple interactions, or they are called their, well, it's an easy model again, um, are very expressive. And a similar statement can be made for um, restricted Boltzmann machines. So why do simple rules generate so much complexity? Why are they so expressive? I believe that um, this is because they jump to universality. So uh, this, is a, this is an intuition and this is an idea that I'm trying to make precise and uh, I want to share it with you. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand the details myself, but I'm, yeah. Okay, so imagine that we plug the complexity of rules of the underlying microscopic rules in the horizontal axis so that simpler rules go more to the left and more complicated rules go more to the right. And additionally, imagine that we plug the complexity of the system generated by these rules on the vertical axis, so that more complicated systems would be on the upper side and simpler ones on the lower side. Now, naively, one expects some sort of reasonable relation between the microscopic complexity and the macroscopic complexity or reasonable by reasonable I'm not sure what I mean I mean some sort of proportionality relation at least I expect that uh, more complicated um, 
uh, systems require more complicated rules. I'll, I'm, I'm going to address Ray's question in a second. Okay. Uh, but this is not what happens. So what happens is that as rules become gradually more complex, they suddenly undergo a very large change of functionality called a jump to universality, after which they can explore all complexity in their domain. So in this talk, I am using universality in this sense as the capability of exploring all complexity in a given domain. And that sense is different from universality in renormalization theory, uh, namely the use of universality classes. And I completely agree with your comment that, that the word universal gets used in different fields with different meanings. And I've been trying to disambiguate this mean, the, the meaning of the word and perhaps we can go there after the talk. I have prepared some additional slides because that's, that's a question that has um, kept me busy. And I, I would love to hear your opinion and get your feedback on that. So, but thank you for your question because universal indeed means for me, Turing universal, okay, for the rest of the talk. So let me revisit the examples that we saw before. Oh, sorry, just one, one comment about a book that I found very inspiring and that has inspired some of, some of the ideas of this uh, research program. It's called The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch and um, I believe that he talks about the jump to universality with an even, an even broader sense um, related to our capability of, gener of acquiring and generating knowledge, but which I won't touch on here, um, but maybe I just, I, at this point, I can just recommend everyone to, to read it, especially the first chapters I think are very inspiring. Okay, so now I can revisit the examples from before. Well, the very first um, cellular automaton was the very fa the famous rule 110, which is known to be Turing complete. So the um, spin models we saw next are also called universal for a definition of universality, um, which means that it can simulate any other spin model and simulate is defined by us as well, uh, but it shares many similarities with the other notions as I will hope to show you. The best understood and the oldest notion of this, of this little set is um, our universal Turing machines. This is of course a pillar of computer science and um, yeah. And we have universality for neural networks again. This is a bit different from universality in Turing machines. And I believe it should be very similar to universality in spin models, but we're trying to make this precise. Um, and there are other, I mean, it is tempting to speculate. Uh, I'm working a lot with a complex systems professor and expert and a, just a delightful person, Ricard Soule, who was uh, with whom um, Anna, who is in the audience spent some time in Barcelona. Um, and there are many complicated processes that happen in biology. And biology is an incredibly complicated world in itself. And I don't want I mean, to sound reductionistic or simplistic, that would be just uh, plainly wrong. But um, yeah, there, at many levels, there are things that happen which suddenly become very complicated and perhaps some of these processes can benefit from this perspective on universality. But we are really, we have many ideas, but we're a bit at the beginning of, of this um, exploration. As well as um, we're also trying to go in the direction of natural languages. And uh, Again, there are many aspects in natural languages which, which we could kind of try to approach from the perspective of universality. Um, we're also like, at the, we have several ideas. These are a bit more developed than those for biology. And I can try to explain some of them, but they are not for this talk. My focus is on also 
the research with, with our group and, uh, and the people in the group, we're trying to make precise the relations between universal spin models, universal Turing machines and universal neural networks. And as I will hope to show you, we are focusing first on the relation between these two. Please note that these notions of universality have been independently discovered. So they often like use different words and have theorems with different emphasis, but I believe they are connected. They are deeply connected. And I believe that understanding these connections will help us go to the heart of the matter. Okay, but let me first now continue with this idea of um, the jump to universality and why, why is it the case that this happens? Why, why do they jump to universality? And I don't understand this very well, but I have an intuition which we're trying to make precise. And this has to do with a hierarchy becoming entangled. Namely, consider a hierarchy where kind of on the lower side, we have the systems generated by some rules. And on, the, on, on another level, we have the rules kind of that govern those systems. So a priori, a rule is in a higher hierarchical level than the systems because it, it governs the system, right? So I would say the natural order of things or with the ordinary kind of situation is the one where you have a hierarchy. Now, I'm not entirely sure what this arrow means. I'm trying to make this precise as well, but so that's just an idea. Um, yeah, But I believe that the jump to universality happens when when the systems reach a certain level of expressivity, they can be used to encode rules. And this is fantastic because suddenly rules can take as input the description of other rules. And so they can be used, rules can simulate other rules. I think this is the key to universality. And that's why simple rules are so powerful, because they just need to be able to read the description of another rule and behave like it. That's, that's the point at which universality is reached. And by the way, if you imagine Turing machines, here we would have like programs, and here we would have like every point would be like the description of a Turing machine. In fact, every point would be a Turing machine, I guess, and the lower side would be like data and um, a priori data meaning input strings. A priori a Turing machine determines whether every input string is accepted or rejected, or if it's a partial Turing machine, of course, they are all partial. It's like a subset of these things, but in principle, it, it can at least like say accept an infinite set and reject an infinite set as well. So in this sense, a Turing machine seems to be in a higher hierarchical level than a set of strings, but a kind of all the magic comes in when um, a string can be used to encode a Turing machine, right? A, str a string of zeros and ones can be, can contain, for example, a description of the set of transition rules of a Turing machine. And this description can be fed as part of an enlarged input of your actual, of your original Turing machine, which can then behave as a universal Turing machine. And then so that your universal Turing machine behaves like any other, you just need to change this description of the target Turing machine. I think that something like that is going on. Um, this, is, this is universality as I see this. And um, this tangled hierarchy, in fact, appears in Escher's paintings. Uh, so um, in the very famous example of the drawing hand, this, uh, this hand seems to be in a higher hierarchical level than the calf, but the calf becomes alive and become, kind of gets to be in a higher level than the calf of the very first hand. Uh, which becomes alive and becomes the right. So it's, that, that is a tangled hierarchy. And um, 
this word tangled hierarchy is borrowed from this very inspiring book, Gödel Escherbach, where it's a classic and it's very old, but I think some ideas are, are very deep and, and interesting. Um, where um, Hofstadter makes the point that these tangled hierarchies appear in um, Escher's paintings, as in this example, in Bach's music, in the structure of some of his compositions, and in Gödel's proof, now that's interesting for us, uh, namely in the liar product, it's essentially the liar product, you're saying, I am lying, right? and that is a way of doing self-reference and negation and of kind of feeding back on yourself in a non-trivial way, um, and which I see as a consequence of this tangled hierarchy. And I'll get back to this point later. By the way, Hofstadter, in fact, uses the tangled hierarchy as a hypothesis or kind of speculates that this tangled hierarchy is at the center of um, a theory, or should be at the center of a theory for consciousness. I think it's just fascinating, but I know too little to have an opinion about that. But we are also trying to go a little bit in the direction of the, of the brain. Okay, so just to kind of reiterate one consequence, if your hierarchy um, becomes tangled, is that you can do self-reference and negation. So an element kind of can talk about itself. And I think Nozon has explained this beautifully in his diagonal argument, for example. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an, it's an old story, but he has explained this very clearly, I feel. Uh, can do negation and then you're in trouble. Uh, that's the liar paradox, it appears in so many places. I'll go back to that as well. And that for me is undecidability. I, to me, all undecidable statements I've seen are the liar paradox and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'll give a few examples later, but I, um, yeah, that, that's the thing. So as you see, both universality and undecidability kind of appear from the same structure from this tangled hierarchy. So I see universality as the other side of the coin of undecidability. And um, I'm not, as I said, I'm not entirely sure about, so I'm trying to make these uh, connections precise. I'm not entirely sure about which, like exactly how, which implies which, because this depends on the precise definition of universality, which is a bit difficult to point down. To, um, but I wrote an essay explaining kind of these ideas already like a year and a half ago for FQXI. I call it universality everywhere implies undecidability everywhere because kind of my first principle is that there is universality everywhere, which means that essentially every system can explore all complexity in its domain. This means that essentially every non-trivial system, every system which is not too simple, it just needs to be a little expressive, becomes like super expressive, like becomes universal and can kind of go all the way to exploring all complexity in, in their domain. And the other side of the coin is that there is undecidability everywhere, meaning that essentially every question about the system is undecidable. And that is not a I mean, you can take it as a principle, but, but, but this lower statement is true if you just by a counting argument. I mean, in many systems, but if you count the set of functions from the naturals to zero one, which are computable, then that set is of measure zero. Um, so it's essentially the vast majority of, of functions are uncomputable and such things. So many times this, this can be made precise, but, but I think it's a good intuition to keep in mind, especially in computer science, this may be very central, but uh, in physics, it's very neglected, I feel. All right, so the goal of this, of my, my goal, let's say, is to understand the reach of universality and undecidability across disciplines. Okay, I feel these things are, are treated independently and with a different, different words, different questions. Different, there are different results in many disciplines and I feel they are all 
deeply connected and I, I want to I wanna understand, I want to go across disciplines in order to understand these two phenomena. And of course, also understand their relation properly. And I'd like to get to this goal uh, in two ways or like my path toward uh, that final goal, I suggest to go as follows. First, to establish rigorous links among, on the one hand, uni universality in spin models. Again, that's not, this does not mean universality classes. This means our universal spin models, universality in automata, that is Turing machines, universality in neural networks. And what's more unclear, a little less clear, is universality in ocean natural languages and in biology. And we have started by exploring this link between universal spin models and universal Turing machines. And more precisely, we have done the first step where we describe spin models as automata. More precisely, we describe spin models as the formal languages recognized by automata. And I'll get there in a second. That's what I'd like to tell you about in the next minutes. But the second thing I'd like to do is to establish an overarching framework for universality. And perhaps we need category theory, or in particular, we need some, because we maybe would like to do some like flip side of Lovier's theorem, or what, where, is, where is universality in Lovier's theorem? I don't know. I mean, universal is in the title of Nozon's paper of 2003. But it has a different meaning than mine. <laughs> right. And, and can I just uh, break in and say one thing? To me, universality and undecidability are, are opposite directions. So to answer your question, where is universality? I have no idea. In, in Levere's theorem, I, I have no idea. Um, but also, to me, universality is a strength. In other words, it's able to talk about everything. Okay, as opposed to the that is undecidability is not a strength. Undecidability is a limitation. Oh, the computer cannot answer this thing. So, so I mean, it's fascinating that you have, like you said, two sides of the same coin. But to me, they look, you know, different directions. But but go on. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree, I, and um, it to me, it's like a price you have to pay for being so expressive. Uh, it kind of comes out of this tangled hierarchy, right? Um, right? You can suddenly access like all your colleagues or all your fellows on, on the same level, which is a weird thing to do. Usually you can talk about, or an element should only be able to talk about things on the lower level. But, so it can suddenly kind of, a Turing machine can run all other Turing machines. Why should, this, should, should that be the case? The downside is that, yeah, it can talk about itself, the negation, it's going to run into problems. And that's not, an, as you explained very well, it's not an isolated point that is problematic, but it's the, the vast majority of the points that are problematic. Anyway. I, 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 I think we should wait till the discussion because it's going to be interesting. And Gershom has a point uh, saying, but I just want to say, you see this really, really clearly in um, Gödel's completeness theorem and his incompleteness theorem. In other words, um, for weak logical systems, there is a decidability, you know, you can, it's complete in some sense. Um, and so there's no undecidability, but it's their weak systems, as opposed to that for, you know, um, number theory and stronger theory theorems, there's undecidability, but you can, you can deal with, you know, all, all types of uh, mathematics. So, so you see yeah. that really clearly in, by, by Gödel. But go yeah. on, you, you, you do your talk. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, there are weaker types of machines than, than Turing machines, push an automata and so on, which do not have universality. So neither do they have undecidability as far as I can tell. So the question would be, where is universality in Gödel's theorem? In, in particular, in these weaker versions or, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going on. Yeah. So I am hoping to perhaps use category theory to, I'm not entirely sure, but perhaps it's the right framework for, for this overarching framework. I, I have hopes that this is the case. Okay, and, but first of all, I, I wanna give you an intuition, a, a, a slight of a more, intu, a slight more, a slightly more detailed intuition as to why 
what do these things have in common? Okay, now I want to focus on universal spin models, universal Turing machines, and universality in neural networks. In all of these cases, there are actual and auxiliary variables. And the auxiliary variables encode a description of the original model. Let me explain that. So in physics, we have um, our object of study is a spin model. Okay? That's some Hamiltonian defined on a, on a finite set of variables. This can be transformed into the universal spin model, which is like the 2D Ising model with fields, which has more variables. But most of these variables are gray. These gray things are like my auxiliary variables. And so in this universal spin model, I have some physical and auxiliary kind of spins. There's, there, there's a different word in every subfield, right? And um, okay, the physical spins are gonna be my black spins and the auxiliary spins are gonna be my, my gray spins. And how does the universal model know which target model it is supposed to simulate? Well, you need to feed it with the description of the target model of, the, of this spin model by giving it a certain distribution of coupling strengths. So there's some information that like you can choose somehow these extra and um, the values of these additional local Hamiltonians. And in this choice, you will be encoding um, whether it is supposed to simulate the POT model or an 8D Ising model or a model in a crazy graph and so on. Now in computer science, a similar situation is in place. Consider an automaton with a finite set of rules given in T. And so for any input, say X, it either accepts or rejects. This is very simplified. Um, I'm ignoring issues here of precisely all of no non-halting and kind of undecidability. I mean, they, they can be incorporated into the picture, but that's just a very simplistic um, depiction of the situation. I'm trying to give an intuition. So now this automaton T, let's say a Turing machine can be cast as an instance of a universal Turing machine. Now the magic here is that U is fixed. So the set of, transi the set of transition rules of U is fixed, but the input uh, is enlarged and it contains the description of T. And now this U will behave like T. Yeah, again, up to encoding and so on, but that is the idea. So the actual variables here are my input X and the auxiliary variables are the description of T. The description of T, this part of the input is telling you how it needs to behave. And, oh, sorry. And um, the description of the model is the part of the input describing T. Similarly, in machine learning or for neural networks, say you wanna learn a function f, well, this can be cast as an instance of, um, of you might call it the universal neural network uh, with some coupling strengths or they, they call them weights and biases. And again, we have the situation that we have visible and hidden units. The visible ones are like the black ones are like my actual variables and the hidden ones are like the gray ones are like my auxiliary variables. And the description of F or like the function this thing is trying to learn is precisely the distribution of weights and biases. Okay, so I believe that this one is actually the same as this one because not only the statements of the theorems are very similar, but also the, the structure of the proof is, or the, the whole idea of the proof is very similar. And I currently believe that this one is stronger than this one and this one, okay? But in order to make this precise, we have started by trying to make clear the distinction or the, the analogy between physics and computer science, more precisely between spin models and automata. So this is my focus. I wanna understand the relation between spin models and automata. 
And this is, um, I'd like to sh share with you kind of this recent result of ours, uh, of which we have a very old version in the archive. We have a much more improved version right now, which is not there, not, not yet out. And um, we are also investigating this directly for the easing model and directly for each grammar with uh, Tobias Reinhardt. Okay, so what we do is the following. We have a spin Hamiltonian and we cast it as a formal language. And then we classify this language in the Chomsky hierarchy of languages. And this provides a new complexity measure for classical spin models, different from the usual one, which is the computational complexity of the ground state energy problem and with different easy to hard thresholds. More precisely, a spin Hamiltonian now is an object H, it's a function that maps spin configurations like S1 to Sn. Imagine that each S1 is, a, is an element from a finite alphabet and to a number, an energy. Uh, this energy, in fact, will be expressed in unary. So again, it's a, yeah. Anyway, but now crucially, this is for all n. Okay, so the domain is infinite. This is for all n. This is very important. Now, we define the formal language LH as the set of all input-output pairs of H. If you want, as the graph of the function, as the graph of H, right? So the set of all spin configurations and correct energies. So here I could have written H of S1 to Sn, and for all n. Because I have this for all n, this, this has an infinite number of um, strings. So it's an infinite language, generally. For example, the 1D Ising model is a map from S1 to S. Imagine that S1 are here plus minus one, and I map it to a number, which is, I guess goes from minus n to n, which is obtained as the product of S1 S, of Si times Si plus one. So this is plus minus one, and you, I sum from one to n minus one for all n. Okay? And then the language of the 1D Ising model is the set of all these pairs, the spin configuration and the number. And then once this language is fixed, we prove a theorem which says LH is deterministic context free. It's in a certain level of this Chomsky hierarchy. Okay, so more precisely, as you know, as I heard that most of you are computer scientists, there's a relation, very natural, an important one between languages and automata, namely, if the language is a set of strings, the automata is the one that recognizes our, the language or given, given a string X, it tells, it's capable of telling whether X is in L. Um, so this is the Chomsky hierarchy of formal languages, um, recursively enumerable, Context sensitive, context free, deterministic, context free. These two are usually not distinguished, but it is important to distinguish them for my, for this word and regular. And um, you may additionally know. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know how to go back. That yeah. So Turing machines recognize recursively enumerable languages, linear bounded automata, which are like Turing machines with only a linear amount of tape available recognize context sensitive languages, push down automata, recognize context free languages, deterministic push down automata, deterministic context free languages, and finite state automata regular languages. Now, we show that 1D spin models, 1D means one spatial dimension, but it's a very, very, very generous definition of 1D, in fact, uh, very general. Anyway, for the moment, just, yeah, 1D. Um, spin Hamiltonian, so their language is deterministic context free. Now there's a jump in complexity to 2D or higher dimensional spin models, but in fact also all to all spin Hamiltonians, so they are incredibly connected. They are also, they are only context sensitive languages. And not sure, zero D spin models are those whose domain is finite. So they, um, yeah, and therefore, not surprisingly, their corresponding language LH is finite and so trivially regular. What's more interesting is that we find a, a class of so-called effectively zero D spin models, which are like a class of so-called 
I call them holographic 1D spin models because they are like 1D spin models whose energy only depends on a finite number of spins at each end of the chain. So because it only depends on a finite amount of variables, these language can be recognized by a finite state automaton, because, which essentially only does pattern recognition on, that, on those ends of the chain. Anyway, so that's our classification. So you can see, first of all, that essentially no, um, no spin model is recursively enumerable. And these models here are universal spin models. So that's a suggesting that universal spin models are weaker than universal Turing machines. We need to make this precise. Okay, and for, for the easing model, we find a different threshold between easy and hard. So for the ground state energy problem, these two cases were in P and the 3D easing is NP complete. When we study it as a language, it's just a different object. Then this is deterministic context free and this is context sensitive. And we've compared these things rigorously. And I think the conclusion, I can go into more details in, in this comparison, but the conclusion is that just that it's a different object and it's a different complexity measure. Okay, and since I heard there are a bunch of computer scientists in the audience, let me say something. I believe this is a new relation between physics and computer science, which is describing what can happen rather than what does happen. So the usual relation um, translates what does happen to a formal language. More precisely, the time evolution of a physical system implements a computation. That's the usual relation. Here, we are um, expressing what can be true, not what need be true. I believe universality statements are, universe, are statements about what can happen. A universal Turing machine can run any algorithm. It need not run any algorithm, but it can do it. And then decidability statements are, sta are cannot statements. There cannot exist a formal system that expresses basic arithmetic and that is complete and uh, consistent, or there cannot exist an algorithm to solve the, the, the holding problem. And we wanted to export all of this can and cannot statements across fields, and we didn't know how to do it. Because the usual relation is not expressive in over can, cannot do this job. So I believe that this relation that we have introduced does precisely this job. It, it, it allows to explore universality and undecidability across disciplines. Yeah, and so counterfactuals are, are brought, um, are promoted to the role hitherto played by the factuals. We can go more in there, but anyway. Um, the, the, there's, there's this new story of um, cat, um, and constructor theory, and then uh, there's a new recent book by Karen Marleto explaining some beautiful ideas of what could be done with by promoting counterfactuals to this much more prominent role. Okay, and there's nothing new. I, I won't say anything new here. You know all of that and decidability. So let me explain in my words how I understand, at least, for example, Nozon's paper and um, several ideas in this direction. For me, the message is that no system can talk about itself. And by a system, you can take a set and talk could mean describe an attribute, uh, namely a function from the set to zero one, so that if the element of the set has the attribute, then it is mapped to one, if it doesn't, it's up to zero. And then the attribute A is identified with a set of elements and um, could can be identified with a set of elements, which are mapped to one, which is an element of the power set of S. So for example, if S just has three elements um, and the power set has eight elements, then the attribute being different from B would be identified with this element of the power set. Now, the fundamental fact is that a set can never be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with its set. And to prove that you assume that it can, and then uh, reach a contradiction by uh, leveraging the liar paradox, essentially, by building self-referent and negation. Yeah, so that's, that's how I understand this entire story, that the liar paradox can never be captured from within the system, no matter how 
powerful your system is. It doesn't matter if it's the real themselves or something even more fancy. Um, its own layer products will always be outside the system. It's very powerful because it has many incarnations. Mm, the sentence is false, the halting problem, Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, Russell's paradox, Tarski's theorem on the undefined and the finability of truth, Cantor's theorem on different infinities, and so on. There are more. Um, there's an, a great article by Thomas Bolander on the Stanford Encyclopedia of, of Philosophy about examples of um, self-reference. It's very far-reaching because it just you can never fix it, at least not in a finite way. So from the set, you can build a power set, and then you can build a power set of the power set, and so on. So people try to build kind of hierarchies which carefully avoid the layer paradox at each level. So like no level can refer back to itself, but then in order to recover the full expressivity, they need to, um, they can only do so in a limit, which I find unsatisfactory and can be made general and precise. And I enjoyed very much Nozon's um, work and paper here, as well as Nozon's book, which I really like and I always recommend. Okay, so in conclusion, um, in order to, we are here still at the first step of linking universality notions, namely between spin models and automata, uh, where we have described spin models as automata, more precisely, we have described them as so automata and used the Chomsky hierarchy as a new complexity measure of Hamiltonians. I see that as a first fruit of linking these two fields in Disney relation. Well, there's this natural relation in computer science, we can export it to spin models, and we find this classification. The outlook are essentially these two principles. I want to explore their, their reach, universality everywhere and undecidability everywhere. Um, and for these kind of crazier connections, um, I have the pleasure and the, the honor of collaborating with Ricard Soule. Um, we are also, we have some now preliminary ideas with Sebastian Stengele and Tobias Reinhardt to, for a unified framework for a universality and undecidability without category theory so far. Um, yeah. Let's see how this is going. This is still in its infancy, but I think it's very promising. And, you know, universality, I come from quantum. So for me, it's very natural to ask what happens at the quantum level, Spe especially there are notions of universality for quantum spin models. There are quantum Turing machines and there's notions, there are notions of quantum machine learning. They should again all be related, but I'm trying first to understand the classical case. I don't know when we'll get to the quantum level, maybe in some years, I don't know when. Like to, for me to understand this, but, but that should be possible too. Okay, and I think that's my final slide that uh, I'd like to say thank you to the people in the group, particularly Sebastian, Sebastian Stengel and Tobias Weinhardt for working on these topics. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Um, I have some things to say, but I'm going to let other people, I think other people should speak and fire away. Ray, you had a few questions you want to, you want to, you want to pose? Yeah, well, one of them was just a technical question. First, when you were saying the auxiliary spin is the idea that when you sum of the auxiliary spins, the effective model that remains is, you know, is the spin model you're trying to simulate? Sorry, what's the question again? If you oh, you were talking, you were talking a while when you said you know you had a way that a you had a, you said well, a spin model could be universal, and you showed that you you showed the picture of auxiliary spins. Yeah. So I want to is the idea that if you sum over the auxiliary spins, the remaining path integral is you know the model you're trying to target model. No. The idea is that there is a configuration of the auxiliary spins, uh -huh. so that um, um, so that the two, the spectrum of the universal spin model. Okay, let me let me be a bit more precise. Mm -hmm. The statement of simulation is that the low energy sector 
of the universal spin model is identical to the full energy sector of the target spin model, which means that there is a configuration of the auxiliary spins so that the universal spin model is in the low energy sector uh, so that the two things behave equally. So it, I don't know if you're a bit familiar in condensed matter physics, there's very much the idea of an effective Yes, yeah, I, I am, and there are probably two people in the audience who are familiar with that. Okay. So, yes, there are. This is like a effective Hamiltonians from condensed matter physics, like in, in steroids. It's like an extreme version of an effective, it, it's kind of telling you that if you look at the low energy sector of a, of a Hamiltonian, it can look completely different from the, from the full thing because the low energy sector can behave like any other spin model. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks thank you. Lots of details. I'll read your paper, but I thank you for, for clarifying that. Gershom also had a question or a suggestion. Well, uh, yeah, I had a bunch of sort of high level thoughts uh, for the the, inspired by this interesting talk, uh, some of which are references that you might not have because you, as you said, have been sort of starting on to this. Um, so um, I, I guess uh, the first thing I'll mention um, is uh, a frequent speaker at this uh, uh, colloquia, um, Larry Moss has a wonderful book with Barwise, uh, Barwise and Moss, uh, Vicious Circles, which is on uh, non-standard logics that sort of model these sorts of paradoxes in different ways. I don't know if it's uh, what you want to go for, but it's a great reference on a lot of mathematics behind this stuff. Um, Thank you. Um, so I wanted to recommend that. Um, the uh, second thing, I don't know, Nosen, if you've seen this paper yet, it just came out the other day. It makes it referenced your paper. So if you haven't seen it yet, Dave Roberts just published a lovely paper on the Lever uh, fixed point theorem. And it actually answers sort of in the negative um, a certain question posed here, um, which is it, um, Lever's theorem, as uh, we know, uh, takes place in um, a Cartesian closed category. And uh, Roberts does some reverse mathematics on it. And he says, what's the minimal category to make this thing go through? And, he, mm -hmm. and so he cuts it down to, uh, not for exactly, but uh, a much a category that corresponds to a much weaker logic, right? It doesn't need a full notion of a product or uh, whatever. It's, it's sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, it's got some monoidal structure, and uh, but um, you just cuts it down as much as you can. So it's a nice little paper, and and that sort of goes to that. Well, you know, if you think of Turing as universal. Uh, but it turns out that you can get uh, self the, the minimal criteria for for the self reference um, Lever style are are, are s s significantly weaker than your uh, Cartesian closed category that corresponds to a Turing machine or lambda calculus. Then that already shows that uh, th these are in some ways uh, different measures. Right, the correspondence isn't as tight as one might uh, imagine. Um, uh, but uh, the, what and, and now I come to my own unstructured thoughts, um, which is also that then the third thing I was going to mention that's a classical thing that I think also helps illuminate this is my favorite paradox, which is a uh, Scalum's paradox, um, which um, it, it's full the Wikipedia page. It explains it pretty well. It's easy to accidentally rediscover, which, which is basically that um, when you, um, you, you can have a system that looks like you've got a fixed point problem internally to the system, but externally, uh, that's not observable. Uh, and an example I could give is uh, I can build a little logic and that logic can have in it a um, notion of um, say the, the um, uh, what did I say? Well, well of um, the, the, the naturals, right? And then I can diagonalize my notion of the naturals and um, get internally a notion of, you know, uh, the reals, which as we know are uh, incommensurable, right? That's the, um, however, externally, all right, I can build a model of this logic uh, computationally or, or whatever, or set theoretically. And I'll notice that both types have um, externally the exact same cardinality 
because I built my model in the naturals. And so both types correspond to the naturals externally. So internally, you have the paradox, but externally, the cardinalities actually correspond. And, and this is sort of a non paradox, but it shows the, that. Um, and what I want to use that to motivate is the idea that uh, we universality, if we want to talk about it in the sense we're talking about it, is sort of a logical property. Um, and um, it sounds to me very close to what logicians often will talk about as adequacy of a system with regards to a model. And the point being, when they talk about adequacy, it's all is relative. You have to specify both the system and the model. And you've already sort of encountered that when you say, well, this is universal, but it's less universal. Well, you know, universal compared to what? Or as you know, they sang in the 70s, uh, real compared to what, right? So um, I, I think maybe framing what you're calling now universality, which is, you know, a much more exciting sounding term is really just a question of sort of logical adequacy with regards to propositions about a given semantics uh, uh, might help a lot in uh, that regard. And then finally, my really speculative point would be that uh, how would one relate the question of diagonalization uh, to the question of, uh, well, what you were saying, universality, and I'd say would be some form of adequacy, is that, I mean, this is where you hit the size paradox in a way, um, potentially, right? This is just a conceptual idea now which is that if you have a system that can uh, is powerful enough to diagonalize, right? And you get self-reference in that diagonalization sense. Um, and then you're trying to be adequate uh, with regards to statements about the system itself. That's where you begin to hit these size paradoxes. And sort of the Roberts result shows, well, this can happen in a very relatively computationally weak system that corresponds to sort of a very weak linear logic as well or something, or this can happen in a much bigger system um, because you're not talking with regards to some sort of or notion of universality or whatever. You're just talking about what a system can say about itself and its own size of its terms. And so then, uh, so then the power to have, so, so that's where you sort of, I, I guess might, might see some sort of uh, relationship in a way is that if one side of like, cause you know, the, with these adequacy theorems or whatever, you really want to have some sort of bijection, right? You know, between the statements that you can make and then the representable objects. And mm -hmm. if you let one side, um, you know, diagonalize itself, then all of a sudden uh, you, you, that blows up your bijection and you can no longer have it uh, because of the size condition. So, so that might be one way to think of the, the relationship of the two, but that's a high level idea. Can, can can I can I be a little bit um, explain Gershom or like formalize what he what he means by that? The whole thing of Levere's theorem is is if that uh, morphism from let's say n to two to the n, if you're talking about, if it's surjective, then you have this limitation in some sense. To me, the universality you're talking about is the is exactly the surjectivity of that map. Okay. The surjectivity says, oh, I can talk about everything. In other words, let's talk about the, the natural numbers to the power set of the natural numbers. That's the simplest example. Well, the surjectivity of that map means that every natural number can, uh, I'm sorry, every subset of natural numbers can talk about, um, uh, about uh, every subset can talk about the, um, I'm sorry, every subset has a number then which which can list it off okay and that's not true so in some sense the natural numbers by themselves um it doesn't have that surjectivity but to me that's what it would mean um, okay okay let me let me start answering kind of the many comments um first of all uh, gershom's comments um i very much agree with your comments and your ideas um and in fact um our preliminary ideas in formalizing universality go in the direction of several of the things that you mentioned. Universality is now defined for us as a, so given a set of, we have a set of elements and a set of operations that can be done on these elements. We ask which operation is universal, meaning that it can generate the entire set essentially. So we have some very, some very simple examples which are universal and they sound trivial, but they are universal with respect to that system. And um, we are also um, proposing different grad gradations or like types of universality. 
namely so-called weak universality, which would be what happens for spin models, and strong universality, which is what happens for, for Turing machines. Um, yeah, and we're trying to make all of this precise, but the, the main point is that it is indeed a property of a given universe. It's not a property, yeah, it's just a universal with respect to a given universe. Um, I'll make sure to have a look at the references you mentioned. And regarding um, Nozon's comment, I don't know if that's all there is to it. Um, it would be a bit disappointing if it were the, if it, it, it were this case, I think. I mean, we when we say a universal Turing machine can simulate any other Turing machine, we don't say it can run, it can compute any function from the naturals to two or to zero one. Uh, but still you can say it can uh, uh, access Okay, it's a countable infinite set, it's, it's kind of tiny and so on, but still it's a, it's a non-trivial statement. So um, I feel that there's more to it than, than just kind of wanting this beta, I think you call it beta or whatever in your paper, to be surjective. I, I, I feel that the, the, the key element into why this universality happens is that Kind of these rules can simulate other rules, like simple rules can simulate other rules. I feel, which also indicates that it's a property directly at the level kind of of the grammar, of what's happening, at, and that that's what we're trying to make precise. I think that's the best I can say so far. Uh, maybe it's better to look at it from the halting, you know, halting thing. So you have the natural numbers going to the natural numbers to two also you know two to the natural numbers and you want to know um you know the source of the of this of this mor morphism is the programs and you want to know can every program talk about every um model of it okay any, anyways that, that's that's you know fine I, I don't i think i think you're right it is a little bit more complicated but uh, that's i to me the first stab at what universality means uh, can I just say a few, two other things, um, uh, just to extend this, you know, notion of, you know, looking at the logic point of view from Gödel completeness theorem, which is not universal and which is somewhat uh, decidable to, uh, you know, his undecidability th theorem, which is more universal, uh, somehow Chaitin's name should be mentioned because Chaitin has this notion that uh, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem says, um, you know, a 50 pound system can't prove a 75 pound theorem. So in that sense, he, he's like, uh, he's quantifying, you know, what universal is, and uh, he's quantifying what, you know, to what extent something is, is, is is universal and, and stuff like that so so that might be a, a direction to look and and in terms of just a one quick question of looking at this diagram that you have on the screen right now i would have thought that the 2d and higher would be recursively enumerable not context sensitive you don't think of self-reference in terms of context sensitive um, you usually think of self-reference, you know, Turing machines have self-reference, not linear bounded autonomy, although it probably does have self-reference. Um, so, so I was wondering, what, were you shocked by, by that result? Or did you think it should be recursively enumerable? That the last thing um, should be? No, we didn't know, but um, that's exactly the point that, um, remember, I didn't indicate it in the slide, but these are universal spin models. Right. But universal Turing machines are here, right? So, so they, so it seems different. It seems it, it seems different. That's what I mentioned earlier. I believe this right. is a weak. This is like a weak form of universality, and this is a strong form of universality. And I can tell you in plain words, um, an easy way to understand this is that the order of the quantifiers is exchanged in the statement of universality. Namely, in a universal Turing machine. A uh, universal Turing machine, a uh, Turing machine is universal if there exists a description of any other Turing machine that can be fed to it so that you will simulate T, essentially. Here, a spin model is universal if for any other spin model, there exists a description which can be fed to 
to the to the universal spin model so that it behaves like it. So the description here seems to depend on the target. Mm. It seems to be weaker than this. And this, by the way, this seems to be the same. This weak universality is also what seems to appear in neural networks. And is there anything about um, universality of linear bounded automata? I don't think so. No, that would be interesting. Yeah. So one obvious question would be to take, you know, things like was it Turing machines with bounded tapes, which the which correspond to those automata, and see, yeah, could you get the statement with the swap quantifiers there? Sorry, what's the question again? Well, you were saying that your version of universal, the weaker one, you were just saying now had the quantifier swapped. Yeah. So now, if you take sorry your the weaker language, I guess the constant sensitive, there is a class of automata that corresponds to them. If I remember, it's the something like a bounded Turing machine. So I was thinking maybe to look to that proof and see, okay, could I get for this class of weaker weaker than Turing machine automata the corresponding universal statement that has the quantifier swap to work? Right. That's right. Yeah, but I. I, I was assuming this doesn't exist. I mean, we haven't found anything like that. Do you think this might, that would be very interesting indeed. Well, first question is whether, you know, someone would have been motivated to ask that question. There's a lot of questions which may not exist simply because no one thought to ask it. Yeah, I mean, that would be a, a very interesting outcome of this investigation if we can inspire, let's say, automata to, to consider new notions of universality coming from spin models. Like so far, the direction is mostly that we benefit from computer science, like we export results from computer science to physics, but perhaps our notion of universality can say something about computer science as well. That would be cool. Well, generally, a lot of my interdisciplinary experience, you know, for example, even there's a few Bergman was in town, there was some project we did, which was close to things, say in that case, we ran the matrices, but again, we were asking somewhat different questions. When you come to something from a different field, you may tend to ask questions that people would not ask in that field and hence don't necessarily have answers. Or wouldn't any, you know. any other questions, any other comments? I, I want to shut off the recording. Mm -hmm. um, simply be, I know let people go if they want to go. Um, anybody else? Anyways, I think we should thank our speaker again for an absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, seriously. Anyways, and and Gemma, I, I, I category theory is, is belongs here definitely, definitely, definitely. <laughs> so, um, but we, we you got to figure out how. Anyways, uh, again, I'd like to thank the speaker, and we're going to stay on afterwards. I just want to give a, a, a push for October 20th. We're going to have Dan Schiebler is going to be talking about machine learning and con extensions. And again, everybody's invited to come and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Uh, Gemma, I'm not leaving and anybody else, so we can continue this conversation as long as you want. I just wanted to end it and uh, stop the recording. <laughs>